So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Marie-José Kravis, the chairman of the Economic Club and a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to the members of the Economic Club of Chicago and Washington, D.C., as well as those from the New York Women's Forum and British American Business, who've also been invited, who've been invited to join the call today. So welcome to all of you. Um, the Economic Club of New York is one of the ni nation's leading nonpartisan forums for discussions on economic, social, and political issues, and we feel we have a special responsibility in the context of what's happening uh, in markets generally, in oil, in financial markets, in oil markets, and the coronavirus situation to bring our members the most relevant discussion topics. And we've all been watching the markets, um, especially over the past few weeks. And today we bring you our very special guest and club member, Stacey Cunningham. Stacey's been a great supporter of the Economic Club, and I want to thank her uh, for her steadfast support, but also for taking the time today while the markets are open uh, to meet with us. Stacey is the president of the New York uh, Stock Exchange Group, which includes the New York Stock Exchange and a diverse range of equity and equity options exchanges, all wholly owned subsidiaries of Intercontinental Exchange. She is the 67th president and the first woman to lead the New York Stock Exchange Group in its 228 year history. So today's program will be a conversation, which I'm fortunate to be moderating. Questions that have been sent to the club from members um, have been shared with me and I've tried to incorporate as many of them as possible. The call will end promptly at 3.15, and as a reminder, this conversation is on the record, and uh, we do have additional media on the line. So, uh, Stacey, if, Stacey, if you're ready, we'll begin. I am. Thank you so much, Marie-José. Thank you to uh, Barbara and the, and the club more broadly. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to discuss with you, uh, Stacey, you know, current market conditions, what you're seeing, what it means. But um, before we jump into the heart of the subject, maybe if you comment, this has been your first week on March 23rd. Um, we saw the closing of the historic trading floor at the NYSC, um, and you've moved you moved to all electronic trading. And I'm just wondering if you might tell us how it's working and. How uh, have the designated market ma makers or the brokers uh, been uh, operating now, and has it has it uh, at all affected their ability to participate fully in the markets? Just give us a quick wrap up of what you've seen this week. Sure, sure, and and, and you know, first before I even do that, I just want to start off by extending my deepest sympathies to all of those who have already been directly impacted by the, the rapid spread of COVID-19. And I'm sure many people on this call have contact or friends or family who, who are directly impacted. And, and so, you know, as, as we all do, you share, share that sympathy and also deepest gratitude for everyone who's fighting this pandemic on the front lines, especially our healthcare workers. And certainly, you, you know, United, we're, we're confident we can battle it, but I, I just wanted to start with that. So yes, we, we moved the New York Stock Exchange to fully electronic trading on Monday. While we operate five different equity markets and two uh, options markets, only one of those equity markets has a, a combination of both people and technology, and our options markets both have a combination of, of a trading floor as well as, as well as electronic trading. And so for those three markets that were combined out of the, the total eight, we moved to an 100% electronic trading in, in an effort to help battle the, the pandemic that we're seeing and, and limit the number of people that we're bringing together. We've, it's been very, very smooth. It's a smooth transition. It's not something that's new to us to operate uh, electronic markets. We certainly do that uh, and have done that for several, several years. We, you lose the benefit of the, the human judgment and the human value that's combined with technology. So we do feel strongly that the combination of people and technology is, is much more powerful than either one of them on, on its own. We certainly can run electronic markets and that transition has, has, been, has been quite smooth. So you mentioned the market makers, and without getting too deep into it, every every uh, company that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange has a designated market maker. That's a human being that's assigned to overseeing trading in their stock, and they do that every day from the trading floor. There are also a number of floor brokers on the floor each day, and they're representing customer orders. They're not trading for their own accounts, but they come onto the trading floor and, and represent their customers in that fashion. So while those people are using algorithms to trade each day, they can adjust those algorithms by applying human judgment. So the fact that we've closed the floor doesn't eliminate 
all of that, that order flow that comes into the exchange, those market makers are still trading algorithmically. They're just not doing it from 11 Wall Street, the 11 Wall Street trading floor. So they still participate and provide, provide that, that value. So just um, to elaborate on that, just last year, in fact, I'd say it was a fortuitous uh, decision. The New York Stock Exchange um, undertook a major upgrade of its underlying platforms. Uh, I think your program is called Pilar. Um, and uh, that, as you mentioned, powers all of your uh, equity and options exchanges. Um, how, um, I mean, that that's something that you would have done with or without coronavirus. So talk talk to us a little bit about the technological challenges uh, that occur in just your business activity, your respective yeah. crises. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we just need. It would be helpful maybe to take a step back and think about. You know, the, the technology that we use at the exchange every day needs to be ready for whatever market conditions may come at any point in time. And so, you know, while we're here to talk about the, the markets and talk about what we're seeing, uh, what we're seeing from the you know, market activity, it's, it's really important to recognize that people are behind the markets. So markets are a reflection of public sentiment. So for very good reasons right now, people have a high level of anxiety and it's very traumatic for a person who's worried about their personal safety and health and that of their family and friends. And there's a lot of that happening right now. It's also traumatic for a person who's worried about their personal financial stability and the ability to provide for their families. And we're seeing a lot of that right now too. So as we battle this pandemic, there are so many people that are simultaneously worried about both of those things. And that anxiety is being reflected in the market. It, it's well known facts that markets are, are much more volatile during periods of uncertainty. And this is an unprecedented period of uncertainty. We have so many questions we don't have answers to, right? When We don't know yet when we're gonna see the peak number of cases uh, you know, of COVID-19 as it continues to spread. We don't know what the short-term and long-term impacts of the protective measures you know, we've, we have already put in place. We don't know what their impact is gonna be on the economy. We don't know what, it, what the impact of the stimulus packages we, we just developed will, will be. Uh, we don't know when people are going to return to work or when they're going to go back to normal activities, which means restaurants will be able to reopen. So because we have so many questions that we don't have answers, you know, they're, they're, you're seeing that being reflected in the market. And so we're seeing so much market volatility. And we'll talk a little bit about that, the fact that we've triggered market-wide circuit breakers four times uh, in, in just this, this past couple of weeks. So well, we that's have a lot I, just, of that, I mean, you've had a record uh, <laughs> record moves. When we speak of volatility, you've had record moves. I think what eight cases of uh, of trading four percent up and down, up or down. Um, yeah. So, how are you handling? Do you feel that your your technology, your markets are performing well in handling? Yeah. A absolutely. So, so what's really just like the uns markets react to uncertainty. And they do that in both directions. You know, as they feel like they understand better what's going to happen, we see markets rebound. That's what we've been seeing over the past couple of days. And so, you know, I would urge people to be focused on the long term because over the long term, you know, market markets can move back quickly as soon as we we do get things under control. But you're, you're right. Over the past month month of March, we've seen not only major market moves, we've seen major market volumes, and that means that our systems need to process three times perhaps what the average daily volume is. And even more so when you look at the number of messages that a system processes. And yeah, the exchange tell, us little, tell us a little bit about the message traffic because we hear a lot about volume, but I'm not sure that everyone understands uh, the intensity and the amount of message traffic that you get. Could you just so elaborate we, on that? and on some of the peak, yeah, some of the peak days recently, we have processed uh, 330 billion messages in a single day, and that that is three times uh, more than three times what a, a normal day might look like. And so, so on a normal day, you would nevertheless process about a hundred billion messages. Yeah, that's every new order, every new order to buy, new order to sell, new price point. All of those are getting processed by the exchanges all the time, and exchanges need to be ready at any point in time to have an increased number of of messages as market conditions change and. The industry as a whole has done very, very well during this crisis. Now, I understand that markets have been exceptionally volatile, so I don't mean to downplay that from a um, market price level. We might not like the prices, but certainly from a market performance standard, the industry has really risen to the occasion. We have not seen delays in, in messaging. 
uh, and getting responses back. And, and that's important because it, I think it would be helpful to understand market dynamics a, a little bit and market makers provide liquidity into the market. So that means that they're buyers when everyone else is selling and they're sellers when everyone else is buying. And they're there to always ensure that there's a price where you know, an investor can buy or sell. It's really a very sophisticated risk management exercise. The more effectively they can manage that risk, the more liquidity they can provide, which means better prices for investors. So that becomes even more complicated when prices are moving really quickly, as we've seen over the past few weeks, and they're moving you know, dramatically from minute to minute. For market makers, that's critical even at the microsecond level because they can give investors better prices if they can manage that risk better. So there are a number of things that we focus on and to ensure that they, they're able to manage that risk as effectively as possible. And that's why our technology matters so much. So the, the, you mentioned NYC Pillar, that's the technology platform that we rolled out last, uh, last year, last summer on NYC. And what's, not, what, what's most important about that is not how fast it is, but how consistent it is. So that every time a market maker or any one of our clients sends us a message, it takes the same amount of time to get that message back so that they know they can manage their risk better if they know that the system is operating the way it's expected to. And they, they, they're able to price that in. And so that, that's a really important part of the equation. So it's, it's really critical that our systems perform well. And what we've seen under this enormous amount of strain, we have not seen a degradation of that, that performance, that our systems are continue to perform uh, you know, it's, it's the same idea of somebody answering the phone when you're calling your broker dealer, right? You want them to pick up the phone right away. And that's what the exchange is doing. We're just doing it through, you know, with 330 billion messages in a, in a day. And so that, that's why it's, it's so important because it does ultimately mean to better prices for investors at the end of the, at the end of the day. So you don't feel that you need to revisit protocols to further protect markets as some have suggested? Yeah, so I think that there's, there's a, a couple of different things there. One is how are markets functioning and working, and, and they're functioning well. It, there, there is a lot of talk about should the markets stop, right? Should we stop trading entirely? Should we, should we be uh, you know, putting a pause on the market overall? And I, I think the fact that we have the market-wide circuit breakers is by design. That was a pre-planned response to extreme market volatility. And the reason why it's important is because it introduces certainty. And as I mentioned, like anytime we can have more certainty in the equation, we can better manage uh, risk for, for investors. And so the, you know, even discussing closing markets can actually increase that level of uncertainty if people feel like they're going to perhaps be stuck with a market closed and they won't have access to their money and they don't, they don't wanna be in that situation. It can actually put selling pressure uh, on the markets already. And we saw that in 1987, uh, after the crash of 87, it, as soon as it was discussed that perhaps markets could, could close, we saw additional selling pressure on the market. In response to the crash of 1987, the, the Brady Commission implemented market-wide circuit breakers. Now, I've spoken to Secretary Brady, uh, former Treasury Secretary Brady, a number of times over the past a week or so, because he's seeing that creation, those market-wide circuit breakers it, live in action now, and also feel strongly that the, the reasons they were introduced still apply. And that giving investors an opportunity to take a step back, take a deep breath, understand what's happening in the market, provide an opportunity for the other side of the market to show up and slow things down a little bit, but not actually removing the right to, to trade, it, it, you know, to, to, op to have access to, to your money is a really important part of, you know, keeping the markets open is, is really important. And I, I, I think we can't overstate how important it is because investors, one, the markets are a reflection of public sentiment. And that's useful information for everyone who's making decisions around our government, our legislators that are making decisions around actions to take. Seeing how severely people are, are responding is, is really important information to have. If you close the markets, you also don't eliminate any of those underlying concerns that exist that are driving markets down. Right, so you're, just you're, them. you're just yeah, you're going to pent it up, right? And, and and you're more likely to see even more volatility once you reopen. And third, and frankly most importantly, you're denying people access to their money. And if in, a, in this time of need, when there are more people who may need to go access their money, even if they don't like the prices, we can't take that away from them. So if you're talking about a long-term market stoppage, in which and you know, and 
that that would be a long time that you're saying, hey, you can't you can't have access to your funds, and and that's certainly not something that that we would do. And all the conversations that I've had with other exchanges, with our regulators, with our government, no one is suggesting that they're even considering closing the markets. Well, in and fact, I, you know, do you argue, wouldn't you argue that it's at moments like this, that moments like this really highlight the importance of capital markets? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you still have companies looking to, you know, they need money so they can do the, to, to take action. And this is really a time when the capital markets are, are even more important to so many of those companies. And, and I, you know, I look at the companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We started over a week or so ago starting to keep track of all the actions that they're taking to help contribute to the solution for, for, um, you know, for this outbreak. And with our hundreds, there are hundreds of actions we've, we've started to track, and that's not a comprehensive list. You know, whether it's 3M and GE. Could you share some of those? Could you share some of those with yeah, uh, absolutely. privacy? For, for GE, 3M, all, all focusing on protective gear and, and mm -hmm. introducing new N95 masks to protect our healthcare workers. Uh, Merck, similar, doing doing same, same thing. Johnson & Johnson working on, on vaccines and having the ability to, uh, you know, to, to help provide medicines to to offset this so many of the technology companies that are that we have like slack who provides workplace agility as so many people have worked are moving to work from home companies like PagerDuty, box salesforce they're all offering their services for free to small businesses that might be struggling or or you know trying to give them tools that they can use during this time you know unilever is providing you know, all sorts of sanitizers and soap. I mean, I could go on and on. There's, there's literally hundreds of examples of steps that companies are taking to help solve the crisis. And I think that's really important because we are a United Nation and we're all coming together to, to put our, our best efforts. You know, Hanes is, you know, turned over their clothing manufacturers to, to turn it in to be able to manufacture face masks as well. So I think all of those things we're seeing and the capital markets are giving people the ability to continue to have access to money so they can so they can do those things. Now, you were once a floor trader. In fact, I think that's how you where you started at the uh, at the exchange as a floor trader. Yes. And uh wondering if, you know, you'd share from you that not only the vantage point of the of the head of the NYSC, but also from your past experience, what what are you seeing? What are you uh what is it what do you think it means? What are the macro trends that you think will be longer lasting? Yeah, you know, I think I think I'll touch on the floor trader aspect for a moment because this is a challenging period uh, for the floor traders because they are a very patriotic group and feel strongly about the value of our capital markets and fighting any any anything that that comes our way as a nation. And part of the way they fight is by functioning, making sure the markets are functioning well and dampening volatility and coming to work. So whether it was 9-11 or, or historic events that, that are endless, those traders always showed up at work to make sure that the markets kept functioning. So being asked to do that from the sidelines is, is tough for them because there's just a, uh, a want to help. And, and so that's, that's a bit of an adjustment. I do think that markets move more quickly. You know, we've seen a lot of, of shifts in, in market trends over the past few weeks, and and they they move more quickly. We're seeing we're seeing that reflected, but the anxiety is also unprecedented. So it, I don't think this is just about algorithmic trading. This is about unprecedented levels of concern, and you're seeing that in the market. But markets respond very quickly. So when you see good news too, they will respond to that also. So that's why I feel like it's very important for investors to not be trying to trade this market because if they can just take a step back and wait for us to get some certainty around what the solutions are and where we need to go, I, I do think that we have the ability to, to recover from this. And, and everyone is focused on finding the solution, whether it's the stimulus package that's put together or, or the, the Fed actions that they've taken to address some of the illiquidity that we've seen in, in pockets in the market, people are focused on, on solutions. And, and I, I'm confident that we will get through this and we will get to the other side. It's just unclear how, exactly how long that's going to be. Well, in fact, uh, many commentators are, are now saying that we're not only living through a pandemic, but we're living through the globalization of a panic or the globalization of anxiety. 
And in mm -hmm. fact, that's been amplified also by 24-7 media coverage. And you're seeing that in, in, uh, in your markets. Right. Every single time there's a, a new case in your local community, you hear about it, which you wouldn't have heard about it at that quite as rapidly historically. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the Internet, Intercontinental Exchange. I mean, the New York Stock Exchange is part of ICE, of ICE and across ICE markets. Uh, how are uh, other asset classes performing or reacting? Yep. Broadly, markets are, are functioning well, are certainly in the future side at ICE. We, we operate, um, you know, our futures trading has been uh, very smooth. We have had, you know, plenty of liquidity there. In the bond market, we have seen some difficulty with liquidity that's already been dramatically improved over the past few days with the substantial <clears throat> actions that the Fed has taken to address it. Uh, even, you know, I, I think one thing I, you see people talking a lot about also is the impact of passing, passive investment and ETF. Right. And we, we operate uh, the largest ETF market with 75% with of ETF assets under management. And so we very closely watch this and, and you'll see some commentary pointing to the fact that ETFs, uh, might be discounted from, from their actual value. And really what we've seen is that ETFs are becoming a price discovery mechanism on their own. So as we've come into the markets in the morning, very often the futures have been in a limit state. So those market-wide circuit breakers that we touched on, they're triggered by a 7% downward move in the S&P 500 index. But that S&P 500 index enters a, 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 a stoppage of trading uh, a limit state, well, not a stoppage of trading, but it, it's not allowed to decline more than 5% uh, in order as a, a circuit breaker that they, that they have. The, so it's hard to, when you're coming in in the morning when the futures are in a down 5% limit state to know, are we actually going to trigger that 7%? You've seen the ETFs that are actively trading in the pre-market really become that price discovery so that people get a sense of where would the market be down. So now people are also looking at where is SPY trading at 925 to get a sense of are, are, are we going to trigger a market-wide circuit breaker? And it's actually done a very effective job of predicting where the market was going, going to open and what those prices were, particularly so, in the fixed. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, you know, I, I mentioned some of the liquidity issues that there were in the bond market. In the fixed income space, ETFs have actually been a helpful price discovery tool where the bonds were, were not trading liquidly. And, and that, you know, there were some bonds that for several days they, they weren't traded, yet the ETFs were still liquidity and price, and price discovery. So you saw disconnected prices between ETFs and their mutual fund NAVs. And those mutual funds were using a fair value process, not pricing exactly what the bonds could be traded for in the dealer market. So the ETFs actually helped to show real-time valuations uh, of the market without Without the actual, without the actual um, bonds trading, and so I, I think as we go through the the post mortem on on this market period, we'll look at where where are there things we can benefit from going forward to provide some more transparency to investors and better manage risk through, in the future. And so, besides uh, besides ETFs and and the role that they've played in this uh, in this recent uh, turbulence, are there other areas that you're looking at and in fact, in the long term, and doing your post mortem to improve uh, transparency and market conditions. Yeah, I, I do think we'll 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 have an uh, a retrospective look on on the interaction between futures and and the circuit breakers because you know as I mentioned, the futures were in a limited state, mm -hmm. and the market wide circuit breakers are, are are triggered. I think you know every time there's a major market event, the industry comes together and very constructively looks for lessons learned and how can we improve resilience. And we have done a very good job of introducing more resiliency throughout the years. You don't actually get to see the results of that work until the major market event. And, you know, I mean, suppose that's a good thing, but you, you want to see where you can fine tune it. So we, we, we definitely come together and, and, and work really hard to look for ways to improve. And, and we've done that. I mean, when the market wide circuit breakers were first introduced in 1988, they were based on the Dow and they were, they were point based. It was, a, it was a good opportunity to modernize those by moving to percentage base and focusing on the broader S&P 500 index. We'll, we'll, we'll go through that exercise of looking at lessons learned 
and putting in additional protections in, in the overall market that we can benefit from. Just, just like we're going to change everyday behavior, and I imagine that coming out of this pandemic, people will be better about washing their hands and using sanitizer, and, and I think we'll see the same kind of steps that we take in the, in the markets. So you mentioned the liquidity issues in the bond market, but there's another aspect to liquidity. There's been just so much liquidity injected into the economy and into markets, and I'm wondering how you think that will evolve going forward. Will that accrue to companies, to stocks? Will that be a trigger for inflation? Have you? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I think really what we could take a step back and we look at what's been happening and the actions that the Fed has been taking and the actions of the stimulus package, I think they're all pointing to the fact that we're going to focus our energy on where it's needed most. And I, we certainly saw strains in the bond market and already we're seeing improvement there. And, you know, it'll certainly be studied for, for weeks to come. Do you think if you're looking at if you're looking ahead, the, one of the questions one of our members was asking the question of whether you thought there'd be a pent up demand for for IPOs going uh, going forward. If you look a little bit beyond uh, beyond this crisis, no one wants to say a time whether it's the second half of the year or, or next year. But do you think that there's uh, this build up in uh, in demand for for IPOs that might uh, appear? Yeah, I think there are a lot of good quality companies out there. Many of them are taking actions right now to continue to help and support their their communities and communities more broadly. And when when markets become more stable, I think we'll continue to see them uh, look to access the capital markets. We're already there. Still, are companies that are considering it even during these turbulent times. Just three weeks ago, we had an IPO that raised two billion dollars uh, in light of the massive market moves, and they're a Canadian company called GFL, and they provide uh, sustainable waste management, and and they successfully successfully launched during uh, you know significant market volatility. So I, I don't think the you know it's certainly there are many companies that are putting off their timeline, and they're likely looking to later in the year. But I, I, capital markets are still going to be an avenue for for some companies, even as they even as they you know are evolving to the changing conditions. And it varies how much the, the, the outbreak impacts their over business, their business model themselves as well. So what are you worried most about, I mean, short term? And then we'll talk maybe about the medium and longer term, what you're most excited about. Yeah, I, I think short term, I'm most concerned about how rapidly we can get money to those who need it. So, you know, I just think about my local restaurant laying off 70 people you know, right away because they didn't have a choice, you know, and I, I think this is about, you know, helping to find ways to get money into people's pockets as quickly as possible. And I think if we can do that really effectively, you know, we can help limit some of the long-term damage, but it means we have to move fast. And from my conversations that I've had with, with our, our government and others, people are very focused on taking those actions. We just need to, to make the right ones uh, quickly. Get, get it done quickly. So you're concerned about getting money into the hands of people who obviously are furloughed or let go and so on and so forth. But there's also the worry about keeping growing, con I mean, going concerns going because um, after this, if those restaurants or those small businesses or the dry cleaner or what have you have disappeared, there won't be jobs for people to return to. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think I do think that that's why the faster we can get a handle on how to have protective tools to protect people in a way that they can go back to work. And I mean, I think about it even for our own business, right? We fully intend to reopen the trading floor. We're not going to do that until we can keep people safe. But that doesn't mean we, that has to happen after uh, the, the virus is completely eradicated, because that's not realistic, right? I think much before that point, we're going to get a sense of how can we test people for antibodies? How can we test people to see if they uh, are carriers. You know, I think all, all of those tools will have available to us at some point, and I'm encouraged by all the work that the private and public sector is doing to get to that point more quickly. And I think that's when we can start getting people back out to, to living in, in closer proximity and to limit some of the social distancing, social distancing that we've put in place. Do so you think the ability to test and to measure will be probably the determining factor? Um, to allow uh, businesses 
to reopen? I think it's going to play a big role. I, I think if we can give a level of confidence to that, that we're not exacerbating the pandemic and that we can get, to, you know, there's sort of two steps to it. One is wanting to actually limit the negative impact. If we can, if we know we're, that we're not uh, enhancing any negative impact, that's, that's one thing. And also just deal, addressing people's anxiety. So there's the combination of can we keep people safe and will people feel safe? And those are two related but, but different things. Right. And we need to be able to do both of those things. And I think testing is going to play a big part in that. And so what are you most uh, assuming that we, I, I don't want to say resolve, but that we're able to manage the, this problem and that we're able to come back to, and I hate to say the word normal, but to a functioning economy? What are you most excited about? Well, I think that, that this is absolutely a crisis, but how we respond during crisis truly defines us. And we will get through this. You know, people feel helpless, but we are not helpless. You can control the precautions that you take. You can control how we behave. And we can also control how we support each other. And so I'm optimistic by the fact that people will rise to this occasion and be constructive and work closely with each other to, to help, help their local communities. And you're already seeing that everywhere. I mean, there are GoFundMe campaigns. There, there are so many funds being put together because people are trying to help. And I think anytime we can challenge ourselves to be the absolute best versions of ourselves, is a good thing and we grow from that too. But where do you see the New York Stock Exchange, let's say in two or three years, assuming uh, no other surprises? Well, I, I think we'll continue to have sanitization stations all over the trading floor like we have uh, <laughs> introduced. And you know, we took a number of precautions, but yeah, it's really reflective of how rapidly this has been unfolding. It was only just four or five weeks ago. I, I was at less than maybe three and a half weeks ago, I was uh, out at a conference across the United States and not thinking about getting on an airplane. And, and you know, it, within a week after that, we were sending people home and having them not come into the building. So we first went through limiting the number of people in the building. Then we were limiting um, 700 employees home uh, two weeks ago. And, you know, so that they could, they could work from home and not, not be in the building. And then we closed the trading floor this week. So I, yeah, I think we've seen how quickly everything has rapidly evolved and, and we'll continue to, to see that. So I think some of those- You had to do an outstanding, you had to do an outstanding job also testing all your systems to make sure that they'd operate um, on an, uh, operate electronically with the floor closed. It must have- that you know, must well, I'll tell you, we didn't balance. do that. that. That wasn't something we had to do over the past few weeks because we do that all the time. So we don't get to predict when, when something might happen in the market. You don't get that. No one gives us a heads up that, hey, you might, you know, in, in the first quarter, we're going to see some major market activity. So we have to always be ready for that. So we did the most of that work uh, as we're constantly upgrading our system. So as I mentioned, the technology migration we did over the summer, that was when we were doing a lot of testing about how the systems would perform, even testing remotely to be able to trade without their brokers and, and without our, our market makers in the building. We test that every quarter. We so that's market market business record. practice for every you. Quarter. So that's regular yeah. business practice for it you. Is, it is. And so uh, we didn't make any changes with respect to our systems in, in advance of moving to fully electronic on, on Monday. And, and that's an important part of how we think about business continuity so that people could, you know, so our customers aren't, we're not asking our customers to make changes as they're coming into the market. And they're also dealing with many of their own challenges as so many of them have moved to split workforces and working from home. Where, I, where we did see, as many other companies also saw, a, 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 bit of a, a bit of a scramble, was just making sure our employees could effectively work from home. You, know, mm -hmm. you mentioned we're, we're part of ICE. With 6,000 employees moving a workforce that's largely an in-the-office workforce to pretty much 100% work from home is a shift. Now, we always had the ability to work remotely, but when you put everybody on a work-from-home system at the same time that so many other businesses are locally doing the same thing, making sure that we can work effectively and having enough bandwidth and, and the technology resources to do that when the, when the entire city is doing the same thing was certainly a large feat. And I, I give a huge shout out to our, our IT team who really did a fantastic job of getting this company, you know, a, a remote access at, at large scale. So you mentioned that you 
you intend to reopen the the trading floor. Is that the big differentiator that defines the New York Stock Exchange? Having a when trading look, floor? Yeah, when you look at how we trade stocks, we trade them electronically and we layer human judgment on top of that. So what we've seen when we move to electronic trading is, you know, as a result, that, that combination leads to less volatility in our stocks. So people step in and they offset volatility. There are tons of examples over the past few weeks where those people looked at what was happening and very effectively stepped in to provide more liquidity. And I'll give you one example. Uh, two weeks ago when, when the president announced as we were going into the market close that he was going to fill the oil reserves, that was uh, very, dis you know, there was a lot of buying interest in oil stocks right at the end of the day. And we saw our market makers slow that down and able to, you know, find the other side of that trade and dampen volatility, which worked very, very effectively. <coughs> Excuse me. So our stocks trade with less volatility. When we moved to fully electronic, they still trade with less volatility because we have market makers that are assigned to you know, certain obligations. And so mm -hmm. those, those obligations, they still are meeting, even though they're fully electronic. But we did see, it, you know, it's not quite as good as when they were live. So we see that sell off. It's better than fully electronic uh, markets without market makers, but it's not quite as good as when you have people sitting on the floor. So that, that's why we would go back to that methodology. Certainly the level of human involvement is even more significant during times of stress. So volatility in the markets, IPOs, anytime there's a really complex situation, there's, there's more human involvement. When it's not complex, they're automating a lot of that work and they're using algorithms to trade. So yes, we can do that, but we will, we, will, we will want the full service offering as soon as we can. I'm glad that you mentioned oil markets um, because we talked very much about COVID-19, but at the same time, and maybe not to the same extent, there has been this tension in oil markets with the Saudi-Russian tensions and uh, an overall uh, sharp decline in, in demand. So I wonder if you comment on, on oil markets and, and how that's affected um, the market conditions. Yeah, and, and we, we have a front row seat to that because of the oil futures trading that we do. And, and we've seen that has that actually has worked pretty effectively. A lot of the commercial market participants that we work very closely with on the ice side feel like there is, um, you know, there is, they're getting effectively getting the risk management that they need with that. So, you know, we, certainly that sector is under strain and, and it's very uh, inopportune timing to have the pandemic happening at the same time that there's this this uh, oil battle. So, you know, I, I think that that timing is unfortunate, but companies are managing through it where we've been working with, you know, so many of them are, are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We sort of see that from the, the corporate side, as well as being the, the futures exchange that helps them hedge their risk. So the markets are operating very well. And are you uh, seeing that as a more demand driven? Um, I mean, we talk a lot about the Saudi-Russia battle, but now with uh, the world in, in seemingly in recession um, on a global basis, uh, do you think that this whole turmoil in oil markets is more demand-driven than it is this political tension? Uh, I don't know. Hard, hard to say. I think it's probably a combination. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it's driven. Uh, the, certainly, political tension is, is playing into it at least to some extent. And what about other commodities? Are there other commodities that um, you feel that um, are red flags right now? No, I mean, we've seen, you know, we've seen movement in the gold markets, but I, I think, I think right now what we're seeing is there's a lot of quick reaction to conditions. And, and I really think you're going to see things normalize as soon as people have some color. And that doesn't mean go back to where they were. I just think you'll see more stability and, as, as we answer a lot of the questions that are outstanding, there's gonna be a higher degree of confidence in what parts of the economy are really going to be impacted and where can, can we recover? I mean, certainly the airline stocks are under tremendous pressure. You know, I mean, if you, if you look at all the different parts of the economy and, and where there's a challenge, that's going to be one. And this, this isn't like the financial crisis where there was, you know, actions that were taken that, sort of contributed to the, the challenges, but it's, it's what we're seeing is this is no fault of their own, right? I mean, this is a, a global pandemic that, that impacted them across the board, you know, and, and, yeah, that, and it's, that's done, it's done anyone's control. 
yeah, it's not in anyone's control, right? I mean, that, that's why I think we really need to focus on what we can control and, and what, uh, because some things you can't control, right? And so let's set those aside, uh, but let's focus on the things that, that we can at, at absolutely control ourselves. And so that's, that's where I think people will be focused. And then also where can we give support? And so we've seen the government already indicating that they'll help, help the airlines in those sectors where, where they need to be supported. So what's, I'll ask you one final question. What's your bet? We've had a stimulus bill passed, uh, uh, in fact, today. Um, do, do you think that's enough or will there be another one in the next couple of weeks? I heard that uh, Speaker Pelosi said there was, there could be more. I, I would not be surprised to see further actions taken as we have more clarity around where help is needed. And where would you see if you had to, you know, give your priorities? And I know that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated situation, but where would you see, where would you like to see more intervention? You know, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the early steps so far. I, I think once we see how, how quickly we can actually get those implemented, we'll have a better sense of what needs to be done. And, and, and I, I really wouldn't want to say just now, because I feel like every single day, this is changing so quickly and we get more color as to what's happening and, and where. And I think if it, you look at the next, the next week is going to be very different from where we are today. I mean, there were, it's hard to get testing a few weeks ago. People are being tested now. I, I think we'll continue to see how businesses are impacted longer term uh, over the, the next few, few days even. And that will give us a better sense of where do we where do we need to spend more. I'm very encouraged by the, the initial stimulus package, though. And I'm sure you're speaking to um, exchange uh, CEOs all over the world. And are you hearing similar uh, reactions to their government actions? Do you feel, do you feel that uh, we're showing leadership, or are they also um, taking effective actions? Yeah, I I think globally we weren't quite as prepared for this as we could have been, right? I mean, I, as, I think that's no surprise. If you just look at how quickly things, things evolved, I don't think we were, we were prepared. Where everyone is still trying to understand what the long-term impact is. And so I think people are, there's gonna be a, now, a lot of analysis that happens over what were the right steps to take and there'll be some second guessing. But frankly, I, my personal opinion is there will be plenty of time for lessons learned down the road, we need to stay constructive and positive right now so that we can determine how, how we can get people back on their feet as quickly as possible. And this is the time for us to be united and to put politics aside and to not think about, you know, what could have been done in the, in the first couple of weeks. I think we really need to be focused on what we want to do right now. Well, I think you've been very wise in saying uh, already early on in this conversation that there'll have to be a postmortem, and when we have a postmortem, we'll have a chance to examine, um, you know, the lessons learned and learned and what went wrong and and what uh, what worked. And um, I think that's uh, that's how you handle these situations. It's hard. Yeah, to I mean, that's how we deliver. run our business, right? We we run very sophisticated technology platforms. When you have a, a an issue with your technology, you focus on fixing it. Right. And then you set your postmortem for later, <laughs> you know, and so I think you want to make sure you're putting all of your energy into a solution and there's, and then, you, and then with clear heads, think about a response. And I think there's a very important distinction between reacting and responding and we need to respond thoughtfully and carefully. And those responses carry you through crisis for years to come. And so we, we have a whole toolkit of responses for market conditions and we've been using all of them. What, it's not just market-wide circuit breakers. There are a number of things that we've been using across the exchanges to dampen volatility and and address some of the some of the concerns. And I know that there are plenty of people that feel like the markets have been selling off dramatically, and we should just stop the pain. That's there's a reason that one's not in the toolkit. Yeah, we need we need uh, well-functioning capital markets, and I'm glad that. You're at the helm of uh, one of the most important exchanges, and you've taken the time. I think we've run out of, we've exhausted our time, but you've taken the time. And as I said at the opening, you've taken time while the markets were open to speak with us. So we deeply appreciate that and um, wish you continued success. And um, I can't say less volatility because that's something that's beyond our control, but yeah. um, at least uh, continued um, effectiveness and efficiency of your systems. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Marie Jose. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, thanks to everyone. I wish everyone uh, a, a safe and 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 well.
rest of the week? Uh, well, be vigilant, and everybody should be prudent. So yeah. um, thank you very much. And um, we'll convene again uh, to our members and those who are on the line. We will be in touch with you shortly. We hope to have some um, some more of these conversations, and we hope to do them as regularly as possible. So, Barbara and uh, the team, I thank you for all your work and all your efforts in putting this together, and we will put more of them together. So thank you very much, and be safe.